Leonard Yamada presents an interesting mix, fish biologist by training, painter by trade, bottom fish fisherman at heart. The family has always been fishing, and I got involved with the bottom fishery back in 1962, 1962 going, tagging along with my dad and his friends. Back in the early 60s, the bottom fishing was more uh, inshore, Moana, you know, Akule, Uku, Papio, things like that. Then toward the later part of the mid-60s, my dad's friends, the Dote, started uh, exploring kind of point ledges and things, and they, they were the first that taught us about the Opakapaka Onaga Ehu fishery. My dad retired and he wanted to fish a lot, but I had a young family, so I, work was important. I was self, I'm a self-employed painter. And my dad convinced me if I take off from work and we change our style of fishing and we, we fish harder and we sell the fish, he can have his fun, I can have my income. And it worked out real well for us doing that. He'd call the weather report every day, he'd talk to his fishing friends. And then he'd call me before I go to work. And he said, oh, the weather is gonna be good, the fish biting, how about we go tomorrow? Meaning we go leave from tonight. So I would talk to my, my customer, whoever I'm working for. And most of the time they'd laugh and they'd say, as long as you bring me a fish. Or some of them would say, as long as you bring me a corner crab, so then I'd have to go crabbing in the morning. Oh, yeah. So then after work, I'd show up. My, the boat was at my dad's place. I'd show up, the boat loaded, everything ready to go. Jump on the boat, go out fishing all night. Come home about lunchtime the next day. My mom used to always like, make us take the fish out, take a picture, yeah. and put the fish back in a box. I used to tell her, you're costing me 10 cents a pound when I take it out of the brine. <laughs> <laughs> but then we'd put it back in a truck, I'd take it to the auction, go home, wash up, go sleep, so I could go work the next day, wake up for dinner when the kids come home, my wife come home, have dinner, spend some time with them, go back to sleep, go work the next day, my dad would have the boat all washed up and everything when I come back in it after work. I just back it up in a garage. <laughs> I think 86 to 88 was the real, when, when we did real well. We were, we were fishing at the most one day a week. I, see. I was self-employed, I'd work my five days. I'd work it out with my, my clients that if the weather came good, you know, I'd take off one day, I'd make it up on Sunday. So I still had my one day to take my dad out. I had my full work week. I had the one day with the family. But in that short, short three years, you know, it kind of made a lot of people want to go full-time commercial fishing because the money was so easy. I see. The few full-time guys we knew, like OSM and Cindy K, they were grossing over 150, 200,000. But one day a week fishing was making more money than my whole week of painting. Oh my goodness. <laughs> In addition to bottom fish, Leonard does other types of fishing. We troll when the ahi's around. We go crabbing, kona crabbing, white crabbing, uh, kaneohi or cocoa head or across to the banks. You know, anywhere, anywhere that's on my way home from bottom fishing. Because <laughs> it's, it's you know, the crabbing is more for my family and friends. Sure. Most of my friends fish. When I couldn't fish, they gave me fish, so when I can go fishing, I give them crab in return because they're fishing when I'm fishing. So no sense I give them back, you know, fish. Today's fishery, most of us are, you know, small boat, multi-fishery kind of guys. And uh, most of the guys are fishing, bottom fishing, strictly for the money, trolling for the fun and the money. Like my dad used to say, trolling's fun, you go out there 12 hours and the fun happens in a half an hour. Bottom fishing is different where it's constantly you're doing something, so it's, it's fun all day. Even, the, even if the fish doesn't bite, you're doing something. You're looking for something, you're trying some, you know, dropping lines, you're moving around, you're throwing palo in the water. You're constantly doing something, so it's not like trolling where you're just riding around. A long time ago, this, this old time fisherman, Dale Crooker, gave a quote that I, I always remember and I always tell my friends. He said, when you look at the price of an onaga per pound, and you look at the price of an ahi per pound, he said, the only way he can justify we trolling for ahi is because the fish is big and our brain is small. <laughs> 
Getting started was a gradual process, and technology changed how he would go after his catch. I started with Electromates. Because we already had the reels, the Electromate units were cheap compared to buying a, you know, a setup. So we'd just buy the Electromate and attach it to the reels that we have. While the electric reel took the drudgery out of bringing up the fish, it was electronics that made the biggest difference. Well, I used to, I used to tell people that, you know, I learned from a Stone Age guy that used only landmarks and intuition. And he'd, we'd search on this table, and he'd hunt around, and he'd find this little knot hole here, but it might take us half the day. Then Lorenzi came along, and he gave us one accurate leg, and the other one wasn't, because we only had one good uh, station. But with that and the depth, now instead of searching all around the whole table, we just hug, hug that line until we reached that depth, so it made it easier, so we covered only half the table to get there. Then GPS came along. We didn't have to search anywhere. We just go, whoop, right there. So it saved us a whole bunch of time, which translates to more fishing time. Right. So we thought, gee, we got you know, three, four times more fishing time. We're going to catch three, four times more fish. But we found out that wasn't necessarily true because the fish don't bite the same all day long. <laughs> so some days you get there early and you get the good early bite that you might have missed if you were searching. But we'd never know because you cannot be in two places at the same time. Right. Yeah, and then there were the days that we get there real early, but we got to stay there till real late until they start biting. The depth recorder helped me find, target the bigger fish. You know, the GPS made it easier to, to get to the area to find them, because they're not always exactly the same place at the same, you know, all the time. And it, it made the selection of, you know, targeting easier. The, the most important thing in the fishery is to know spots. If you know spots and you know, you know the fish are at these spots, then you can figure out how to catch them. And very quickly I realized that my father's friends that fished at night knew spots that had fish at night, but in the daytime they weren't too good. And the ones that gave me spots that fished during the day, you know, at daytime was okay, but at night it wasn't good. So they are different places for different times. Long ago, Leonard and his dad started a tradition of fishing for others who couldn't fish. That continued for years. Especially around graduation time. Now, now not so much because my friends' children have all grown, but yeah. yeah, before around graduation time, yeah, a lot of requests for party fish and things, and we'd make special trips to go and try and get them their party fish. The, the ideal situation was We'd, we'd make money and be able to provide them with free fish. Right. So it's you know, a win-win for everybody. Yeah? Yeah, I get to go fishing. If, if we only catch a fish for them, I got to go fishing. That was a plus. If we catch the fish for them, they're happy I got to go fishing. If we catch two, I made money, they got their <laughs> fish. You know? Those are the times, few times my friends would fish with me, trying to catch their uh -huh. fish for their kids' parties. Good, yeah. And we'd always, during the good seasons, especially bottom season, we'd always set aside money to buy the fish in those situations. Yeah. So you could call them something where they yeah. had to go to the We store used to call it um, putting some fish into the bank so we can withdraw the fish later. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard understands and appreciates that not everyone is able to catch their own fish. A lot of our older friends and older fishermen friends especially don't go anymore and can't go anymore. Yeah. I think a lot of them would like an onaga, but then since usually I don't have enough onaga to give everybody an onaga, and I have, in numbers, paka is the most, everybody gets paka. I, I don't, I like to give everybody the same thing. I tend to go by the number of people in the household. So generally, three to seven pounds, I would say. Over the years, the reason Leonard went fishing started to change. It changed when my children started to go to college and I needed the money, especially after my father stopped fishing in 2004. Yeah, whether I could find crew or not, I had to go, so I went. Yeah, as painting got slow, weather, weather was good, I'd go. Yeah. Usually around the, the good, you know, light wind time, we got rain, so I can't paint anyway. 
So I'd take, take the day and night off and I'd go fishing. And then, despite all the success he had out at sea, Leonard had to take a nine-year hiatus. Since 2000 and, when was it, 2008, I hung my boat up to take care of both my parents, and now, now they're both deceased, and I'm just getting the boat back in the water again. Just as it was when he fished with his dad, Leonard waits for the right wind conditions before he launches his boat. Well, like for us, it's, it's totally weather dependent because we're all small boat fisheries now. In the past, the bigger boats, you know, they, they had range. They could go outside the weather, the local weather, or they could weather the storms, you know. But today's fishery is more an overnight type of thing, a one-day fishery with a lot smaller, faster boats. So we're, we're more weather dependent. We're looking primarily at the wind. You know, we're looking for ideal conditions, variable five to 10 knots. On occasion, depending on the location, 10 to 15. If certain holidays come and we really want to give away fish for the holidays, then we, got, we don't look at the wind and we look for places we can hide from the wind. <laughs> The bottom fish restricted fishing areas, or burfas, closed off much of the fishing spots just east of Oahu and forced fishermen like Leonard to other grounds more than 26 miles across one of the roughest open ocean channels in Hawaii. Now that I have a little bit bigger boat and like I say, it's a gamble for me to go to banks. Unless the weather is marginal or my time is limited, I don't go to the banks. I mean, I don't go to Makapa, I go to the banks. Go to the banks instead. The banks got more spots here. If you hit here, you hit here, don't have got, you know, unlimited you know, spots right. to look for. But Makapu is real limited. That was a sad part of that Burfa, that when they expanded it, yeah, out of the something like 40 spots I had over there, I got three on, in an open uh, area. The State Division of Aquatic Resources has been raising the idea that the Burfas will be reopened for fishing. Maybe. I'd like to get some kind of study done, at least for you know an idea, and then let's yeah. open it up. Because yeah. we gave up so many years. Yeah. But you know, like, like my friends say, maybe I wouldn't have been as patient as I am if I was able to go fishing, but all these years I haven't. And only now I'm ready to go back. So actually, for me, if we, we spend another year, I lose only a year. They lost, you know, <laughs> 10, 15 years already. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's almost like Makapu with the new berfa. I got three of my spots remaining, but they're all on the south side of the ledge. So if I go over there, it, it detours me maybe an hour, you know, an hour if I, you know, it'll take away, if I head straight to the banks, I'll get there an hour earlier than if I went to Makapu first. I see. So if I stop to check Makapu, and the current's going the wrong way, then I lost an hour. Okay. If it's going the right way, I have the decision to make, how long is it going to go that way? Shall I try anchor here and fish here, and if in so many hours the current changes and a fish stop biting, then make the trip to Makapu, uh, across to the banks? Which way is more favorable? So now I very rarely fish Makapu because there's only one side available. I see. Whereas before, current doing a certain thing, I go one side. Current changes, I go the other side. So I could fish all night. Right. And now I'm limited to, to half, a, half a night on a good, good situation. Yeah. yeah. And if the porpoise comes, I don't have that other guy on the other side to distract the porpoise. Yeah. Some believe that fisheries are subject to trends. Leonard believes they're subject to cycles. You know, I, I really believe it's, it's um, all the fisheries are going through cycles. I think everything goes through cycles. Yeah, and the, the, the climate conditions and things used to be more predictable. They seem to have been repeating more, more you know, on a, on a regular basis. So I, I kind of look at what's happening on land and what's happening in the ocean, and, and I try to make sense of what, what's causing trends. And I, I believe it's, it's the climate. It's changed now where before every, I would say every, every nine, 10 years, 
we'd go through these real windy, real stormy, real, you know, type of winter, or this real dry summer. Yeah. And now I think we only see the, the real extremes, and the rest of the time the weather seems to be the same. Some years the currents, the currents always there, but some years they're very extreme. Some years they're not, you know, you can fish all night and the current changes, and, but it doesn't pull hard. Some, some years it pulls hard the whole night. You know, it kind of it kind of changes the dynamics of fishing, and I found that, contrary to what I believed in before, that the moon, you know, makes the current. I found that if there's no current, even on a full moon night, it's good. If there's a current, sometimes on a full moon night is extreme. Sometimes it's not. So I'm really questioning whether, you know, the moon. I know the moon controls the tides, but I don't think it controls the currents. I'm almost certain that we don't have a prevailing current. I think it depends on where the North Pacific gyre is in relation to us. We have spin-off eddies from it. Right. And because they're eddies, they're not, uh, they're not a consistent current. They come and go. They change very rapidly. They're different when I'm at Makapu and I'm seeing certain conditions and I talk to my friend that on the banks, the current's going opposite, but we're both in the Kaibi channel. So right. It's not the whole Kaibi channel moving in one direction. Right. Ultimately, success is all about knowing where to go and when the fish will be there. But you know, you hear a lot about it's a specialized fishery and you need a lot of skill. This is where plenty of the, my fellow fishermen get upset with me too. I don't believe that. I believe I can take you, <laughs> put you on a boat, put the put you know all the equipment, give you so many GPS coordinates, and you can duplicate what we're doing. Because the fish doesn't know if the line, if the line's in the right place with the right bait, they don't care who's up there. Yeah. It's it's knowing those spots. That's why you see these young guys that come out with two three generations before them, instantly doing well.